I could, I could probably preach it without the notes, but I like the reminders. We were praising and worshiping God this, under this big colored tent and worshiping the Lord, and God was moving. People, people were being healed. We ain't even touched, and we ain't laid hands on them. I like that. There's no temptation there. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's no, there's no reason to think, oh, well, God loves me. I anoint people with oil. I pray over them. God heals them. There's nothing wrong with praying for people, anointing them with oil, and then being healed. What's wrong is when the person doing the anointing and the praying thinks there's something special. It, that's just deadly dangerous. I've warned you about it before, and I'll keep warning you about it because, you know, I believe there's a hunger in the lives of people in this room to see God move and to see God save and to see God heal and to see God set people free and fill people with the Holy Spirit overflowing. I talk a lot about that now, don't I? Well, since I was in India and I got to see it over and over and over and over again, it was a reminder to me that it's real. Amen? I mean, that was some, that's what was so special with Jesus telling his disciples, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you a, another comforter. Man, that comforter, he gets close. He gets way down on the inside. You get saved, he comes and sets up residence, right? But that infilling of the Holy Spirit is until when the container can't hold him anymore. And he fills you to overflowing. Don't let anybody argue with you and tell you that you don't get the Holy Spirit until later. That, that's baloney. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in and sets up resonance. You need to start listening to him. Amen? And then one day when you reach out to God or the Holy Spirit just in a sovereign move comes and fills you to overflowing, that's Bible, people. You, you can't ignore Bible, can you? No. So anyway, this last week, I was talking to God. That this thing kept coming to me about gates, all right? And so um, I said, okay, it's time for a word study. And I started digging into the Bible about the word gates, right? And so uh, I got that sermon completely finished. It's packaged up. I tucked it away. I'm ready to preach it, right? And God said, that's not for this Sunday. That's for next Sunday. I said, why? It's communion Sunday. That's not a communion message. He said, I'm going to give you a communion message. So I sat there and I listened. And God didn't say anything to me. So I went to prayer meeting yesterday morning. It was a great prayer meeting, by the way. If you missed it, guess what? You missed it. All right? So uh, we're praying. And so a few of us went out to breakfast. Connie was there. Connie and me and Ruthie, we're walking out of the restaurant. And Connie said, you know what, Pastor, with tears in her eyes, I'm telling on you now. With tears in her eyes, she said, Pastor, you need to teach a sermon on dying to self. And the Holy Spirit rose up on the, enemy, on the inside of me and said, that's the subject, dying to self. Can you think of a better subject for Communion Sunday than dying to self? Yeah, there isn't one. There's not a more pertinent one. Grab your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 6, verse 1. I'm going to give you, after we turn to Romans chapter 6, just hold your place there. In Romans chapter 6, we're going to read the first six verses. I've got a couple of scriptures that, that God gave me that I wrote down. Listen to this note. How many of you want to be intimate with God? Yeah, man, I mean, I, I just want to be close, amen? Growing in intimacy with God is more than external works of prayer or love. It is, one, dying to your agenda. You remember that joke that was out there? If you really want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans, right? One is dying to our agenda. Two is, is these are things you know, but we don't, we don't always let God do it. Amen? One is dying to our agenda. Two is dying to our fleshly desires. And three, this one may be the most dangerous one. You think, oh, the flesh is so deadly, and it is. The truth is it needs to die. That's how deadly the subject on the flesh is. The flesh just needs to die spiritually. Amen? The third thing is, and I'm telling you, I'm finding this especially in the charismatic church. More so in the charismatic church than anywhere is we have to die to our ego. Because of what I warned you about just a few minutes ago. I'm telling you, it messes people up. 
It's why God doesn't get to move like he would like to move in the lives of people because he doesn't have vessels that are ready. God wants you to go to heaven. So what is it like if he knows you're going to pray for somebody and they get healed, or they get a cripple gets up and walk, or a blind person receives their sight, or on and on and on, if it's going to mess you up. God wants you to go to heaven just like he wants a leper to go to heaven, or a cripple to go to heaven, or a blind person to go to heaven. And he's certainly not going to let the gifts of the Spirit operating in your life endanger you. But if you ever wondered what the answer to the question is, why don't we see more of the gifts of the Spirit of God in operation in the church in America today? It's because the people of God can't handle it. And we need to get right with God so that we can have everything that God wants to give us. Every, amen? So every communion Sunday, there's something we have to look for. And I think I've set up a pretty good target today. The flesh, you know, and egos and so forth and so on. Our plans, our agendas. Amen? All right, Romans chapter 6, begin reading with verse 1. We're going to read the first six verses. Now pay attention to the subject of dying to self as I read this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Isn't that a good question? That, that question is so, it should be so obvious to us that it just slaps us in the face when, when we look at it. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Because we haven't finished dying yet. The dirt isn't completely on the grave. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right, okay. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into, it's his death that we should be studying. If we embrace Jesus and all that he's about, if we embrace his death, we shall know our own. And I'm talking about the flesh. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. My heart was broken in Kansas City, Missouri. While I was there preaching in a church, another pastor stood up in an international ministry and confessed to sin in his life. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not mad at him. My heart is broken for him. And my heart is broken for that ministry. My heart is broken for that church. But it's not just him. It's a predominant problem in the body of Christ in America. I, I know you probably get tired of hearing these things. You know, and, and the thing about it is, I, I, I talk like I talk, I bark like I bark, I, you know, I, I wave my arms, I get excited, I'm passionate about these subjects because I want to say, no, devil, not Foothills Bible Church. Not Foothills Bible Church. Not me, not us. Amen? Because somewhere, some way, someday, somebody's got to take a stand, you know? You know, most of the time I try to be real careful about it. I'm not trying to insult the church or the body, you know, like church by name, here, there, whatever. I'm trying to say that I'm, I'm convinced today of the fact that the American church is in deep, deep trouble. It's just in deep trouble. And if we're going to get a hold of, of, of the way to fix it, and we're going to get a, hold of the way, uh, get a hold of the word in a way that keeps us on the straight and narrow, it's got to be this church. I cannot stay and pastor this church if you don't let me preach this gospel the way it needs to be preached. And you let me. You people encourage me even. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, anyway, having said that, you know, I wrote down the word introduction in big bold letters and put a you know, colon at the end of it. And then I wrote this verse that you would think doesn't have anything to do with the sermon, but it does. God said, this is the prayer and I prayed this prayer over me. I prayed this prayer over you yesterday and again this morning. 
In Psalm 19, verse 14, it says, and a verse of Scripture I'm sure you're familiar with, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. 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 What it, you know, the Psalms, you know, are so full of prayers. The psalm to me is just one big prayer, you know. I love it. So listen to this. If you ever ask yourself, how do I do it? How do I grow in intimacy with God? If I had a dollar as a preacher for everybody who ever asked me, you know, that question, how do I grow in intimacy with the Lord? Uh, I'd be pretty well off. And then if I had a dollar for every time I've asked God myself, I would be filthy rich, right? All right? But the Lord asked me yesterday, what have I taught you so far? And so I just... I started penning. I started digging in the scriptures. And everything in my heart and mind kept coming back around to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And I have to tell you the story about the, the preacher that, that would go to the eighth grade little boy's Sunday school class every year. And he would ask them a half a dozen questions. And the answer is always Jesus. Did I tell you that? It bears repeating. I'm going to tell you again. Brace yourself, all right? So this year, the, one of the elders' wives was teaching that class, and the elder went to the pastor, and he said, hey, i got to give you a heads up. My wife's cheated. <laughs> she told all the eight grade boys that whatever you ask them, the answer is Jesus Christ. And he said, well, I'll fix her. <laughs> so he goes in the classroom, and he says, all right, boys. He said, what's gray and furry, has a bushy tail, and gathers nuts? And those kids went, <laughs> looking at the pastor because they knew the answer is supposed to be Jesus, right? But it can't be. He said, it's all right, boys. Answer the question. What small, gray, furry, has a bushy tail and gathers nuts? Finally, one little boy raised his hand and he said, I know the answer is supposed to be Jesus, but he sounds like a squirrel to me. <laughs> Which I, I think that was a pretty good, you know, analogy of it all, you know. Look, unfortunately, I've been guilty of this. Unfortunately, most pastors only give about half the answer they need to give. We're not going to do that today. I'm going to answer questions for you, all right? All right. So what is the answer? I'm going to try to illustrate it for you. I, I started digging. You can dig up illustrations. They're, they're all over the place. Returning home from a long journey was a pirate. He'd spent many years lying, stealing, and cheating in a faraway land. Storing up a great chest of treasure for himself. The pirate held on tightly to that chest because he saw something of much more value than just jewels and gold. Rather, he saw in that chest the fulfillment of all of his dreams, his hopes, his aspirations. He knew that that treasure was his key to a good life. The pirate, having made his fortune, decided it was time to return home. And after boarding the ship and having traveled a great distance... From the shore, a storm arose. It didn't take long for the storm to overtake the ship, and soon the ship began to break into pieces. Eventually, the pirate and his treasure plunged into a cold sea. He began to sink, holding on desperately to that chest. As the pirate was sinking, all that raced through his mind was, how can I get my treasure to the surface? Slowly, the pirate began to realize that life was not in the chest, but on the surface. And that holding on to that chest would cause him to die. Reluctantly, the pirate let go of that chest and began to swim upwards towards the surface. We are a lot like that pirate. Holding on to our agendas, our egos, our fleshly desires, thinking all the while that they will bring us life. But in reality, they pull us down towards death. Growing in intimacy with God occurs as we die to ourselves, let go of our treasure, that we may begin to swim upward toward Christ who is life. Today I want to discuss with you what it means to die to self, letting go of the treasure, and also what this new life is that Paul describes. Our first point is how to die to self. Dying to self or die to self. What caused Christ's death was his commitment. Oh, man, i, I got to slow this down. What caused Christ's death was his commitment to fulfill the will of his Father. And this is the death that we enter into in baptism. 
No one ever told me that before. You may have heard it in different words, you know. Here it is again. What caused Christ's death was his commitment to fulfill the will of his Father. And this is the death that we enter into in baptism. The average Christian doesn't know anything about that. They don't know, they don't know how to pray to God, Father, help me understand that, that, that statement. Help me understand this truth in the Word of God. Because there are certain things until you understand you can't get it right without his help. You're never going to get it until you talk to him about it and you pursue him in this, in your prayer life, so that it can make a difference. It can change you. It can feed you a hunger like you've never known before for the presence of God in your life. It'll cause you to wake up in the early morning hours and know that you want to get up and go talk to him. Amen? Because you know that if you obey him and you get up out of that bed, even if you've got to make a cup of coffee first and start sipping, right? It, it, I'm telling you, God knew whether you were going to get up or not. But when you get up, he'll meet you with joy. God is an emotional God, and he'll meet you with joy. You want to make God happy? Just do what he tells you to do. Amen? If he wants you to get up early, get up early. Guess what you'll find yourself doing? This is what I've learned. I go to bed earlier. I just do, you know? Man, 7 o'clock in the evening rolls around. You can ask my wife and my sister-in-law. I start going, oh, man, it's getting late. <laughs> it's getting late because I know that if I don't go to bed, I can't get up and meet with him, right? Or if I do, I'm so tired, I can't hold my head up. And I want to give him my best. I want to give God my best. Jesus is our best example of what it means to die to self. He always set the will of the Father above his own. Always, always, always. I want to read to you Romans verse uh, 4 of Romans 6. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism unto death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So, here's the notes I wrote. Jesus' death began at his birth. Listen to me now. Jesus' death began with his, uh, with his incarnation. Did you know that? Everything Jesus did on this planet was to build up to the day that he gave his life on the cross for us. Everything. Jesus' death began at the incarnation and ended at the crucifixion. To be buried with Christ is to have begun our own personal journey toward Calvary. What does that mean? It means from the day we get saved... Till the day we go to be with Jesus, we should be in the process of dying to self. Are you, are you getting that? Is that Pearson you're thinking a little bit? You know, in my Christian experience, I've dwelt on all kinds of things. I've dwelt on my needs, you know. I've dwelt on blessings. I want God to bless every area of my life. Not, not, I have not talked to God enough about this subject. That's what he's brought me around to. You know, you've asked me for a lot of things, and I've given you a lot of things. Now I want you to focus on this. I'm ashamed today to stand in this pulpit at 67 years old and tell you I finally got some focus going here. But I got breath in my body. My physical body's still going, right? So my spirit's still in here. I mean, this, this carrying case for, my, for, for the real me, my spirit, who I am, is not so damaged that the spirit's got to leave. It's still in me. I'm still breathing. And there's still a lot for God to do. Amen? All right, so what is it all about? Death to our agenda. It's about submission to the Father's will. And it's about death to our ego. I said it a little different than I said it before, and I'll be doing that along and along. I highlighted this. We're called to trust in God and his plan for our lives when it agrees with our agenda and when it does not. Because very seldom... Will God's agenda agree with ours? Because we think we know what's best for us. In Matthew 26, 42, write that down if you're taking notes. Because we're going to have to, we're going to have to feed on the word of God today. And I'm going to give you the references. And we're going to put them on the screen. But you, you're not going to be able to look all of them up. Because we're going to, we're going to let God let the scriptures work on us today. But you've got to make note of the scriptures. In Matthew 26, 42, he said, again... For the second time, 
Jesus now, this is Jesus, again for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. I used to think, wow, that was Jesus' thing, right? It was Jesus setting an example for us. It wasn't Jesus doing his own thing, you know. Oh, Jesus did this wonderful thing and prayed about, you know, the Father's will over his own will. He was setting an example for us. I used to think that Jesus died on the cross, you know, and it was a substitute for me, but it was also to set an example for me. There's still some things that need to go to the cross. Amen? Listen to me carefully. Jesus, in his death on the cross, made a lot of provisions for us. He gave us salvation. Uh, he, he provided on, with his stripes on his back for healing in our physical body, right? But the only provision, and you really can't call it a provision, that he made for the flesh was nothing but death. Look, look, I'm telling you, it's why you get in a room like this. I remember one time someone asked me, what's the biggest crowd you ever addressed? That's about 3,500 people. I was scared to death. I looked out in this auditorium, and 3,500 people looked like a sea of heads bobbing up and down. And the guy that invited me to the platform uh, to speak, he asked me later, he said, is that the biggest crowd you ever spoke to? I said, yes. He said, I'm going to tell you a little secret. 3,500 people in that room. He said, every... Thing about man's inhumanity to man is represented in a room with 3,500 people. And you'd be surprised how small a room of people still represents a lot of fleshly stuff. It just does. You know, in the day that we forget what we're made out of and that we need to give it to God every day is the day that we're blindly heading in a terrible direction. God help us all. Amen? All right. Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Who? Jesus. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. You know what? I believe God wanted that passage of Scripture there. Somebody needed to hear that. I don't know what's there. But that's okay. Amen. I'll let God preach that one. So how about how about death to our material possessions? You know, someone once asked me um, if I thought that my home could be an idol to me. It's a legitimate question, right? But it's a question I faced with God. I can honestly say humbly that no, my home is not an idol. I can, I can sell my home whenever God says sell it. And you listen to me. When God says sell it, I'll sell it. If God says stay in it, I'll stay in it. And if you ask me in the future if my home is an idol to me, I'll, I hope and pray I can say to you again because I don't, I don't see change in my mind. My home is not an idol to me. But thank you. Uh, I can't remember exactly who asked me that, but thanks for asking. Every now and then it needs to be answered. Amen? All right. Okay. All right, Matthew 19, 21 and 22, Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Wow. Matthew 19, 24, Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, Romans chapter 6, verses 13 and 14. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Is there anyone here today that would raise their hand and say, I understand exactly what that's saying. I understand every word of it. Uh, is there anyone? I, I, I told the Lord a, a while back, I can't remember exactly when it was, I said, Father, I don't think I understand this passage of Scripture the way I should. So the Lord told me to read it again. So I read it. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, for unrighteousness, 
But present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you. What? what? Why? Why will sin have no dominion over me? It said, the first line, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. So what does it mean that I need to do? I need to do the opposite of that. I need to present my members uh, to God as an instrument for righteousness, don't I? We said, Brother Dennis, would you like to know how to do that? Would you like to know? You need to know. Because God said to me, I've told you before, and I'll tell you again. You talk to me about it. You declare it to me, and I will make it so. You declare it to me, your members. You know what your members are? Anything about you, anything about your body that you can sin with. You know, I, I, I told you this. This was a gruesome, gruesome truth for me to learn in my life. But the truth of the matter was, I was not at a point in my life presenting my members to God because I, by jinkies, didn't want to. I didn't want to not do the sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? And when we're being honest with ourselves and we're being honest with God, if that needs to be, you know, talked to, to God about it, you better do it because it's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of life and death. We cannot play with our relationship with God. There's no room for play that way. Amen? All right. I told you I'm passionate about these things. You couldn't tell that, could you? Let me, let me tell you another illustration. A young man went out to the desert to meet an old man for instruction. When he arrived, he asked, what is, the, what is Christian perfection? How many of y'all would like to hear that? You see, a lot of people think Christian perfection can't be reached, but listen to this story. A young man went out to the desert to meet an old man for instruction. When he arrived, he asked, what is Christian perfection? The old man excitedly said, follow me. And he led the young man into a cemetery. They approached a fresh grave, and the old man stood on top of the grave, and speaking to the dead man said, You were the most miserable person that ever lived. You were ugly, mean, and the world is far worse off for having you in it. Your death could not have come soon enough. The old man paused after saying this and looked at the young man asking, How did the dead man respond? The young man replied, Well, he's dead. He did not respond. Then the old man looked toward the grave again and said, You were the most wonderful person I've ever met. Everything you did was wonderful. You were so handsome and splendid. The world is far worse place with you having left it. The old man again turned to the young man and asked, What was the dead man's response to what I have said? Again, the young man said, The man is dead. He has no response. The old man then said, This is Christian perfection. The dead man stands before his God and hears him alone. He is not swayed by condemnation or praise. Truly, this man has achieved Christian perfection. Dead man in the grave can't respond to compliments or criticism. He can't, right? So, what's the application? Do you want to grow in intimacy with God? I said, do you want to grow in intimacy with God? <laughs> Thank you. Well, it begins with dying to oneself. And it's something you desperately need God's help with. Amen? People often say, I cannot hear God. But to do that, we must first turn down the volume of self. So how are you doing in this area? This doesn't happen in a single moment or a day. It is a lifelong process of slowly moving toward intimacy with God. There are times where we fall back and times when we more drastically move forward. Each success we have in emptying our treasure chest leads to future success as we see the intimacy we so long for and the faithfulness of the provisions of God. Amen? All right, point number two. I, I got these three words written. The new life. The new life. What is the new life that Christ promises to those who belong to him? 
It's to walk in the freedom of Christ. We've looked at dying to self. Now let's look at the results of our death. All right? You with me? You know, there's a saying. I've studied all the religions of the world. I, I quit when they just kept creating new ones. I just <laughs> I gave up, right? But in the Orthodox Church, it is said and believed that the theologian is not the academic. But here's what they believe. I like I mean, the first part of it. I don't know. In the Orthodox Church, it is said and believed that the theologian is not the academic. It is the person of prayer and sacrifice because they walk in a newness of life. I like the sound of that. Can you say amen? But what is newness? Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 4 again. You need to know where I get these phrases. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in what? Newness of life. So I, I said, well, Lord, what, what newness? What newness? Man, alive, you start, you start talking to God, and he starts speaking back and showing you things. It's pretty dynamic, right? First thing, newness in prayer. Newness in prayer. You want a, a prayer life that's alive? Be intimate with God, amen? Talk to him about everything. Newness in prayer. Luke 6, 12 says, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. You know, I... I've done it before. I don't know now why I don't do it more often. Amen? Next thing, newness and compassion. In Matthew 14, 14, it says, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. And who am I reading about here? I'm reading about Jesus, right? Does he not live in me? Does he not live in you? Amen? Newness in hearing God. John chapter 6, verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Do you know why I said chose this for hearing God? That scripture like that won't mean anything, really, if you don't hear God on the matter. If you, you're not capable of hearing the voice of God, and I'm telling you, you are. I've told you over and over again, I'll tell you over and over again, you can hear the voice of God. And you need to hear the voice of God. Amen? All right. Newness in courage. John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. This was Jesus. If Jesus can do it, can we do it? Because he wants us to. Amen? All right. Newness in courage. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who said, oh, sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. Amen? You hanging with me? All right, good. Thank you. All right. Newness and in insight. Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Remember when Jesus, he would do things, say things like, I don't do anything that I don't see the Father do in heaven. He said that to us, was it A, because he's the Son of God and he could do that, or B, because he was setting an example for us. He was setting an example. That's what Jesus' life was about. It was all about the example. Amen? It was about the example. And then newness of promise. In Mark chapter 10, verses 29 through 31, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now, now, in this time, Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Wow. You know, in Christ, that's the life we seek. That's the life we should seek, right? But here's a note I like. The life that we seek is the life that Jesus lived. That's the life we seek. The life he lived. I grew up with the fallacy, the falsehood, that 
Jesus died on the cross for me so I didn't have to have anything to do with it. A am I the only one? But it's not true. Jesus went to the cross as an example for us. That's where our flesh needs to go. You know, look, I'm going to tell you, look, look me in the eye and tell me you haven't sinned before and that it wasn't fun when you sinned. Sin can be fun for a very, very short period of time, right? And yet people will still choose that brevity of pleasure for a deep walk with God. Wow. We're called to grow in his likeness. And the fruit of this looks like this. Growing in intimacy with the Father. We've said it over and over and over again. How do we do it? You want to be intimate with the Father? One of the ways is with intimate prayer. Intimate prayer. Why do you think I say to you over and over again, talk to God about everything? He already knows everything, and just because you deny talking to him about it, don't make it go away. You want to you wanna practice intimate prayer? Talk to him about everything. Don't be ashamed to talk to him about what he already knows about. You not talking about it doesn't hide it. Amen? How about uh, with compassion? Someone said to me, I preach different since I got back from India. I can see that. I understand that. You know what? I think that anyone who will fill a pulpit in this land from now on better do it with godly passion. They need to do it with godly passion or the people won't believe them. They won't believe them. The leaders of this land, spiritual leaders of this land, if that's what they're going to call themselves, they need to be hearing from God in their life so that you'll be encouraged to hear from God in your life. Amen? If we do this, we'll know the Father's will and we'll know his heart. Amen? I need courage today. I don't ever want to stand in this pulpit and not say something I'm supposed to say because I lack courage. I can't do that. We all need the courage that Christ exemplified in his life. You want to be intimate with God? One of the things that comes with it is insight into heavenly truth, godly truth. We need that. Amen? Do you know that if you'll pursue God in the face of everything that you're going through, you know, maybe, maybe there's this sin that so easily besets you. If you will pursue God anyway, and talk to God and let God just, just keep giving it to him. Keep giving it to him in prayer. And then when he comes to take it like today, let him have it. It's communion Sunday, amen? With all this, I'm telling you that the, the promise of a great reward awaits you. It awaits you because God, God is faithful, Amen? I've often said this, and I've heard a lot of Christians. I've heard a lot of Christians say this. I want to be close to God more than anything. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Have you ever said it yourself? I have. I want to be closer to God than anything. Well, that, that statement will get tested. Amen? God's ready to assume full responsibility for our life as soon as we're willing to die for. Thank you. How many of you remember the movie Gladiator? I hate really talk about movies, but this one came to my heart and mind. In the movie Gladiator, at the very end, there's a scene where the hero is walking through a field of grain toward his family in paradise. The war is over, the fighting's complete, the sacrifice finished, and all that was left was freedom and joy. If you watch this scene, you can't help but desire it. It's a longing of the soul. And it is the reward for all of those willing to die uh, to themselves and live unto God. I don't ever take any of that in the movie to heart. If I see something like that, I think of God. <laughs> I think of what God's providing for me. Amen? The question is, 
What are we really willing to put into our relationship with God? That's the bottom line. What are we really willing to put into it? Amen? Because God's willing to put a lot into it. Amen? Are we willing to die to ourselves in order that we may experience the life of freedom that Christ lived? Christ said, it is for freedom that he set us free. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You know, this is not, this isn't rocket surgery even. This, is, this calls for a life of sacrifice. The only place, and I'm going to challenge you to go dig it up, the only place in the Bible that I can ever find where Jesus suffered true stress. Jesus suffered stress. That's not sin. Listen to me. It was in the garden. He faced stress, and he still went through with God's plan. You go read the accounts in the four Gospels about the garden. Do you remember when he came out and he found the disciples asleep again? Can't you stay awake? He was facing the stress of what was about to unfold in his life. So while he was the son of God, he could do that. No, it wasn't just because he was the son of God. He said several times to Father, if, if there's some other way to accomplish this, let this cup pass, right? But after he prayed several times like that, he realized there isn't any other way. And once again, I'm reminding you, oh, I've thought about the nails. I've thought about the stripes on his back, the crown of thorns on his head. I've thought about the nails being driven through his hands and his feet and stabbed in the side with a spear on and on and on and on. But I remind you, Easter's coming, and we're going to talk about this. None of that, none of that compared to him being willing to take on all of the sin of the world on himself. That's why we can do what I'm talking about today if we'll only let God help us do it. We can do it. Because Jesus suffered all of those painful things that we, we hate and that think about. But he took on the sin of the world. You say, oh yeah, that's bad, Brother Dennis. How many of you realize that's bad? That's tough. It got worse. God the Father turned his back on his son because of my sin and your sin. Our sin. God the Father turned his back on his son. I'm convinced it's the only time he ever did it and the only time he ever will. But it wasn't because of his son. It's because of me. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. You know what it's saying? Stop sinning. Stop. You're a child of God. Instead of, you know, there are times when, have you ever, you know, said something on the spur of the moment, but instantly you went to God and said, Father, I'm sorry, I shouldn't do that. You know, that's not the kind of sin I'm talking about. I'm talking about the sin that you willfully walk into. You even make a plan for it. Yeah, I'll answer the question for you. Yeah, because I've been there, done that. I'm tired of it because God's gotten across to me that he's tired of it. I've heard him, and I'm convinced. That's why I always take advantage of communion services, to take a step closer to him. You know, and that, that's good. That's good word. Amen. All right. Just a few bullet statements here under conclusion. Growing in intimacy with God means we must empty our treasure chest. Amen. It's like a takeaway. You can't drag it to the surface. We've got to let let it go and be set free. Amen. In our baptism, we've entered into this life of death to ourselves. Uh, we have been given the strength to complete it. We've been given the strength. And if you feel like you haven't been given the strength, talk to God about it and he'll give it to you. Amen? Today, I want to call upon all of us to remember our burial with Christ that we might experience our resurrection into a newness of life, even today. For those of us who have been serving God, you know, we got, I mean, I got saved when I was 18 years old. 
It's been a growing process ever since then. Amen? So please understand that giving up control of our agendas, our egos, our fleshly desires, our lives, it's scary. I'm not going to lie to you. It's, kind of, it's scary, right? And God's not condemning us, nor is he threatening us. He is inviting us to trust in him as we submit every area of our lives to him. Now, he doesn't threaten us, but he informs us how dangerous this is to play with the world. He warns us, doesn't he? That's not a threat, is it? God's saying this and this will produce this, this and this will produce that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Obedience to God produces life. Amen? You know what? And I want to tell you something today. I'm not here to condemn anybody. I got no business condemning people. I mean, I don't. And, I tr and I've tried to convey that to you. This is just a message for all of us to get to a point where we're just walking in a relationship with God. If you think to yourself today, am I as close to God as I can get? The answer is unequivocally no. I mean, you, you can get closer to God today and get even closer tomorrow and even closer the next day and even closer the next. Why? Because he's God. And nothing is impossible with him. You know what? You shouldn't get upset today with what I'm saying. You should just get right. We don't need to get upset except we're just upset with ourselves, but then we need to get right. You know what? You shouldn't be so buried in condemnation today um, over what I'm saying simply because this is the truth that will set you free. Amen? Don't you, you know the devil tries to attend church, kick him out. Don't vote him in. Amen? Don't make him a voting member of the church, right? I mean, let's just boot him out in the name of Jesus, right? You know what? This sermon should make you happy, not unhappy. This is exciting stuff I'm, I'm bringing to the table today. Amen? Amen. So God's not condemning us, nor is he threatening us. He's inviting us to trust in him as we submit every area of our lives to him. He's promising us that if we will enter into the suffering of Christ, which, hey, it ain't going to be easy to stop doing that thing you like to do. It ain't going to be easy, but it's doable. Amen? It's doable. You know, we really have to answer the question, what do we want more? Do we want the satisfaction of sin for a brief period of time, or do we want the intimacy even now, even now, today, in Jesus' name, do we want the intimacy today? I think the intimacy with God is better. Amen? He's promising us that if we will enter into the suffering of Christ, we will also, both in this life and in the next life, enter into his resurrection. And the newness of intimacy with God himself and the final word. Amen. Amen. I'd like to ask our uh, elders to come forward. People that are helping us distribute our communion items today. We've got a few minutes left. Let's let God take care of business. Amen. You want to let God take care of business? One more time. You want to let God take care of business? Look, I, I, that's, I, I love you. That's why I do that. All right, I love you. Look, look, I'm, I will tell you this. God told me, you're not going to be wasting your breath in the pulpit anymore. I'll show up, and I'll make it work. So do you believe God will show up here today? Do you believe that God will fulfill his word? All right, two things. I'd like to ask these gentlemen to pass out these emblems. Everybody, he'll take them. And yeah. Now listen up, listen up. I want the worship team to come join me. And before you guys sit down, make sure the worship team is served. Uh, you know, in the New Testament, uh, look, look, look. If you, if you don't understand this, I'll tell you plainly. Um, a communion service is many things. One of it is, is a service for repentance. It's time to change. Amen? And some people, the devil tries to lie to them, tell them, you, don't, you can't partake. You're not, you're not a child of God. Well, get saved. Give your heart and life to Jesus. When we start praying about our lives today, invite Jesus into your heart. Amen? There's no one needs to leave here today and not partake, all right? Don't let the devil lie to you and tell you anything different. You can partake today. Just get right with God, all right? Reach out to God, amen? And um, remember this, you're not only opening yourself up to spiritual healing, you're opening yourself up to physical miracles, you're opening yourself up to infilling of the Holy Spirit, you're opening yourself up to 
you know, all manner of good things. The devil does not like it. So if you're feeling uneasy right now, talk to God about it. Let him fix that. And don't let the devil get away with condemning you. All right? I've had no desire today to condemn anybody. It's not been my desire. My desire is for me, you, all of us in this room, to boot the devil out of our lives. You've got to do that once in a while. Amen? We're susceptible to listen to his lies, and I don't, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I got this childproof container here that I got to open. I want to put that there. Let me pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you, Lord, for the honor and the privilege of pastoring Foothills Bible Church. You put us together. You gave this church life, Father. And it's true, you told us things like, we're stronger together. Turned out to be true. Father, in Jesus' name, I don't want to just preach uh, what I preach and what I teach. To, um, I, I, I just have a burning desire, I believe, in my heart, God, that you place there to see the lost saved. I don't want to continue to do things the way we've done them in the past and expect a different outcome. I want to live a life that's obedient to you. I want to live this word you have me preach and teach. And for us to live this word that you have us preach and teach, to be discipled, Father, by your word, and by your Holy Spirit empowered by your Holy Spirit. Father, much has to change for this to be a place, Lord, that the unsaved driving by way out there on Molden Road will sense the presence of your Spirit. I draw people, Lord, not just to Foothills Bible Church, but every church in this city right now that's reaching out to you and asking you, Father, to raise up places as beacons of light to a lost and dying world. We keep thanking you for this revival because you keep telling us to thank you for this revival. So we obey you. But Father, I pray in Jesus' name that it begins to manifest itself in the lives of people giving their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. And getting saved, Father. Uh, that's the most important thing that we could ever ask you for is uh, help with propagating the gospel to a point where the lost are being saved. Now, Father, we can't do that unless we're allowing you into every, every area of our lives, and that's what communion service is about. It's about focusing on things. Lord, I, I believe there's not enough death in the body of Christ when it comes to the flesh. We can only do that with your help, and we're, we're proclaiming our complete dependence upon you today, Lord. Lord, you are a good God. I thank you for showing each of us in our lives what it is we need to give to you today. May we do it whether we like it or not. May we obey you, whether it agrees with our plans or disagrees with our plans. Lord, there needs to be a whole lot more obedience to you and the body of Christ in America today. May it start with us, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for every person sitting in this room that the devil's trying to mess with them because I know the Word of God talks about uh, taking in an in, uh, you know, uh, unworthy manner. Lord, you're the reason why we can proclaim worthiness if we obey your Word. If we obey you and take a good look at our lives and say, yes, Lord, I see that. I don't like it. I see it, and I know you don't like it. Help me with it, Lord. In, in this service today, help us to give to you what you want, good, bad, ugly and different doesn't matter whatever it is you want uh, we give it to you father in jesus mighty name in jesus mighty name let's take the emblem of the body of our lord and savior jesus christ in our hand for i have received from the lord what i also delivered to you that the lord jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me father uh, they prayed over the emblem of your, your body that night. We're praying over this emblem. Cause it to be to us, Father, everything you would have it to be for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Shall we partake of the emblem of the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, together? 
In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, I pray over this emblem of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the most powerful blood that's ever been shed in this world. For 2,000 years, that blood has worked. It will continue to work throughout eternity. Father, I know that if all 8 billion people in this world turn to you today, that blood has not diminished in its power or ability to save us all. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we partake of the emblem of the shed blood of Jesus Christ together? Praise you, Lord Jesus. Stand with us. Stand with us. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers today. Thank you, Father, for us leaving this place today, having been touched, having been changed. Father, I believe that the measure of success of this service will depend on each and every individual checking themselves to see, are they hungrier now for you, Father, than they were when they got here? If we're hungrier for you now than we were when we arrived in this place today, then we have stepped in the right direction and that you're doing a good thing in our lives. Father, I'm tired in my, in my entire being. I'm tired, Father, of living with regret, fear, lack of, of so many things, Father. But it's not material things I'm talking to you about. It's the desire in my heart, Father, for us to live strong Christian lives for you in spite of everything. All of the blessings in this country, for one thing. May the blessings we experience in this, in this country not stand in the way of our relationship with you, intimacy with you, Father. They have their place, but they cannot be before you. And they cannot stand between us and you. May we always put you first by the power of your spirit. In Christ's name, we pray and praise. Amen and amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness. my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am faithful I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you led me to the fire in darkest night. You were close like no other. I have known you as a father. I have known you as a friend. And I have been in the goodness of God. In all my life you have been Faithful, all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, it's running now, it's running now to me. Your goodness is running now, it's running now to me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I can give you everything. Your goodness is running now, it's running now to me again. Your goodness is running now. 
is running after me. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after It's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing a little more time. All my life. Been All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Father, you're one to be praised, the only one to be praised. Lord, you have been so good to us today. You've been so kind. You have told us the truth of your word, Father. You sent your spirit to emphasize this message. I am a grateful pastor. Father, thank you that none of us, I say a faith statement that none of us are leaving this building today without watching over the seed of your word that has been placed in our hearts, making it a matter of prayer in our lives, Father, that you help us to water that seed by the power of your spirit, that that seed is protected, is watched over, and that a mighty harvest will come forth in our lives, Father, because of the message that you gave us in this place today. And we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise, and the praise Father, in his name we ask. Amen. And amen. God bless you and fellowship together before you leave this place today. Amen.